Let's get ourselves in trouble with all of the people who uh, consider Zero Hedge problematic. Okay, Zacho. All right, so here we have Zero Hedge's uh, report on this preprint that emerged. Um, I think yeah, I'm not this... sure it even counts as a preprint, right? Um, oh, because it's not on a preprint server. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's... So what is this document? And I must tell you, one we thing... We can also show the document. Yeah, you but... want to show the document? I sent oh. you a PDF. No, I've got it here. Hold on. So, Brett, you, for people listening... They yeah, so for people about, listening, what we've got is a paper here. The title of the paper is Unusual Features of the SARS-CoV-2 Genome Suggesting Sophisticated Laboratory Modification Rather Than Natural Evolution and Delineation of Its Probable Synthetic Route. Um, the lead author is Yan. Now, I must say, I don't know Yan. She's been in this landscape for um, months now. And she's a Chinese virologist who had been working and living in Hong Kong, who left Hong Kong um, without the authorities in her home country wanting her to, presumably in April of this year, I think. Right. So I have US. trepidation about her work, in part because it is traveling outside of the realms that might allow you to, you know, as you point out, not a preprint, right? Not right. on a preprint server. Now, I'm not sure why I'm more troubled by a... Uh, a paper put out outside of a preprint server, given that the preprint servers have requirements about credentials yeah. um, and that that can be used to bar certain things. But nonetheless, yeah. I mean, the fact is that the regardless of whose imprimatur is on this uh, with regard to the organization uh, that is that is named here, we've got what is it for? Four PhDs who've written a paper that is um, very well researched. Actually, if you can just put that down a little bit so I can read the screen here. Um, here we go. Um, just second paragraph of the introduction. As a coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 differs significantly from other respiratory and or zoonotic viruses. It attacks multiple organs. It is capable of undergoing a long period of asymptomatic infection. It is highly transmissible and significantly lethal in high-risk populations. It is well adapted to humans since the very start of its emergence. It is highly efficient in binding the human ACE2 re receptor, the affinity of which is greater than that associated with the ACE2 of any other potential host. And it goes on and on and on. So A, this fits with a number of things that we talked about early in our live streams and that you talked about with Yuri Degan, Degan. Degan um, in the podcast that you did with him. Uh, and, you know, they've just, they also, a, a big part of their argument here is that there has been active censorship by the scientific community and by the journals, um, presumably, at least potentially also therefore by the preprint servers themselves, um, against publishing anything that suggests uh, a lab origin for the virus. Right. Um, and, you know, and I mean, we did this for like 18 episodes running back in, the, in our first 18 or so episodes. But, um, you know, lab origin is not the same thing as bioweapon. We're talking about, um, you know, to say lab origin does not specify whether or not you're talking about uh, um, an inadvertent escape um, on one end to an intentional release of an intentional bioweapon on the other or anything in between. And, you know, really most of these analyses are imagining it's some sort of like, oh my God, this is being developed um, and it escaped and no one ever meant it to. Um, but really nothing about how it got out into the world is part of the analysis around does it or does not does it not have a lab origin. I guess the other thing is, as people who've been watching for a long time will understand, that lab origin doesn't mean created from scratch in the lab. It means, uh, you know, borrowed um, from other viruses and um, made into a chimera slash engineered um, from, chimera. from parts. That's one of the things it means, yeah. composited yes. um, from natural sources. But the other thing that it means, which has very ominous implications here, is what's called serial passage experiments basically yeah. use selection in the lab, artificial selection, to imbue viruses with capacities that they wouldn't otherwise have. And so, mm -hmm. um, again, don't know what to make of this paper, though it looks to be very well researched. But the paper is putting together some of the things that we did talk about early on, about how much of the frightening part of this virus, mm -hmm. you know, it's diversity of organs that it attacks, right? It's yeah. ability to transmit between human beings. How many of these features are actually the result of a guided evolutionary process in a lab coupled with a compositing 
which could be yeah. of totally honorable origin. In other mm -hmm. words, people who wish to study a virus that was dangerous to humans may have created a virus that was unusually dangerous to humans, and then it got out through an accident. So yes. that's the most likely scenario mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. And um, we are now beginning to see analyses that strongly reflect this. So at a different level, Zach, I would ask you to put up the, uh, the Alina Chan article from Boston from the... Okay, here it is. Um, yep. Right. So here what we have is a profile of somebody I've been following online since, boy, I don't know, March, something like that. Uh, Alina Chan, who is a young researcher, a problem solver, who became suspicious of the origin story of SARS-CoV-2 on the basis of many things. Primary among them is something else you will have heard us discuss here many times, which is the fact that this virus hit the ground running and was already extremely well adapted to infect human beings yeah. rather than... Well, that's in that list that I read from here in this, in this paper. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in any case, um, this article is written for a lay audience. It's very accessible. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend it. And it does a number of things. One, it tells, told me a lot of things I didn't know about Dr. Chan. Um, one of them that I'm particularly intrigued by uh, is that her story as a scientist is not a typical one of her having been a brilliant student and this and that. She uh, is somebody who didn't love school, always bridled against its uh, its constraints mm -hmm. and um, has, in spite of those things, emerged as a, um, a brilliant virologist who has spotted all the things that were wrong about the story of SARS-CoV-2 and investigated them and has established uh, many of these claims on a very rigorous um, basis, falsified, for example, the, uh, the claim about pangolins and the source of the spike protein. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I would just recommend this article to people. We will post a link to it. Um, but uh, I, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe Dr. Chan will come on the Dark Horse podcast at some point because she seems like a true Dark Horse.